Uh, first up, I'm really pleased to announce uh, that John Geddes, who's the head of the Department of Psychiatry, he is at NIHR, it says on his badge as well. He is the whole of it. So uh, John's going to talk to us about something called remote monitoring. Yeah. Thank no, you, John. I, uh, so, yeah, <laughs> thanks uh, very much. much. Applause, please, for John. Thanks, thanks. Well, um, thanks very much, Andrew, for the introduction. No idea what that title means. But <laughs> I don't know what monetary is, but it's, it, you, you get the general impression. It's, it's sort of not too far away from what it is. But I am going to be talking about this program that we've been developing in the last few years, which is, I think, applicable to the, um, to, to the focus of this fantastic event. And it's, it's great to be here. I haven't been here previously, and I've, I've met loads of people I know, and loads of people I, I know uh, I haven't met before, and it's terrific that everyone's interested in this area. But uh, we've been trying to crack some of these issues for about the last decade, and um, I think that it, it isn't straightforward and it isn't easy. Although there is obviously a massive excitement about the use of digital resources in providing high quality care, and really, if you like, disrupting the way that we provide care um, using these, uh, some of these new solutions. Uh, but w th this is just some of the team, actually, that's been involved in the development of what we, we ended up calling True Colours. And this originated, and I think this is a really important point, it originated out of the heart of clinical practice. Really, as, as very busy clinicians trying to fit in clinical practice alongside our research and everything else, seeing patients with, largely with, with bipolar disorder, we found it so difficult to find, and so did the poor patients, to try and tell us what their mood had been like since we last saw them. And in fact, they got really annoyed half the time, especially when they saw someone else and they asked them to go through it and try and remember what your mood was like. And I once asked John Bell, our Regis Professor of Medicine, how he'd felt for the last year, and he had no idea. And yet we ask our patients to think this all the time. Now, and it is just quite remarkable, actually. It's not just psychiatry and mental health that relies on this, but our medicine actually relies on what we call anamnesis. Really prominent role. We celebrate it. We talk about the importance of the history. The history is about asking people how they felt over X period of time before. Massive problem, we think, this reliance on retrospective or cross-sectional data. And when we talk about this, actually, with colleagues in, in, in other areas of healthcare and areas of medicine, they completely get this. So this thing that we've developed here is already being used across orthopedics, across GI medicine, across neurology, because they face exactly the same things. Neurologists run clinics and say, how have your headaches been for the past few months? What's your migraine been like? What's the epilepsy? How many seizures do you have? All these things where we're asking for memory. And of course, this isn't new. We've tried to come up with solutions to this before <laughs> by using patient diaries, getting people to fill them in. But of course, people lose diaries. They have to fill them in. And, and we use those in the clinics. So and they're not satisfactory. Where do you put them in the notes, etc.? We haven't quite sorted that problem out with the electronic data. And so the whole of management of chronic illness, actually, is all about this. And, and Matthew Hotoff alluded to this problem about not having a very good picture of really what is happening with the patient. And that makes it really hard to get the right idea of, of, of what the diagnosis is, what the problem is, and about putting the interventions in, offering the interventions at the right time to the right person uh, in the right place. Very, very hard. Very approximate way of delivering care. Um, and, of course, yeah, I think it was about 10 years ago, we'd been using paper diaries and we thought there must be a better way of doing this. And people had been trying to do this using computers, but we thought there were limitations to asking a patient to have a mainframe computer in their front room and then bringing a big floppy disk down and downloading it. And those people who'd done that also thought there was a problem um, because, again, you had no remote access to the data. And, and at that time, there was a thing called, called, I think it was WAP, Wireless Axel Protocol. And, 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 and phones were beginning to get a little bit smarter. You know, you could get a bit of color on them and stuff. So we started playing around with that because the technology was there. But we, we then tried it out ourselves, and I think that's a really good way of doing it. Uh, we tried it out on ourselves and a few of our partner patients. This comes down to Andre Tomlin's idea about co-design. And uh, the problem is with doing that is it, it came out in a different way on everyone's phone. No one could work out how to do it. So we thought, let's make it really simple. And at that time, the technology that everyone had 
was still, or a lot of people had, was text message. So we went for that first. But we kind of knew that technology would go on, and what we really would have to do would make our system device independent. Really doesn't matter, things will move on. There will probably be something called an iPhone 6, this is back in 2005, in about nine years' time. We need to make sure it works for that. And so kind of future-proofing what you're doing is absolutely critical because the evaluation you're going to do, whether you like it or not, is going to take a bit of time. And if you make it too device or instance dependent, then it'll be completely out of date by the time you've got the result. So what is it? It's a self-monitoring and, and management system for long-term health conditions. Not just that it started with bipolar disorder, but as I say, it's now used much more widely than that. And it really doesn't matter how people put the data in. When we started, 80% of people used text, 20% of people used internet. Now it's a, the other way around. A small number of people use text because they're a bit old hat. Far more people use the internet and, and, and email. Some people even use this thing called paper. It, it really doesn't matter as long as people put the data into it. And then it captures the data. It sends the prompts out on a weekly basis. It brings them back as a nice, sophisticated back end that puts them in the right place. And it makes them available to patients who can then let other people have it, the clinicians. Um, and of course, those data can then be put into any system you want. And so it started with self-report because that's what we had. But actually, it's now a more general platform and it can simply a way of capturing any data stream that comes in. Now, it doesn't have to be self-report. It can be blood pressure data, it can be circadian gene expression data. We do some of that in some of our studies and we want to capture that remotely. So any streaming data, the human being, if you like, reduced to a, a large number of data streams, the data can come into the system, they'll put it in the right place. So this is where it started and this is where the biggest, because a lot of that is about research and I think that for us, this system's been really helpful because we, we can use it for researching better treatments, better understanding of the disorder. But there are also immediate improvements, we think, for patient uh, care. And at the moment, the standard interface is we use something called the Quick Inventory of Depressive Symptoms and the Altman, because we're looking at bipolar disorder. Um, but you can add any questionnaires you want, and these are some that we include. There's a there's a sort of very simple web interface for the clinician, so I can pull up my whole caseload wherever I am. Um, really important thing, though, is it has to be supported. People don't immediately get how to use it, and that's clinicians in particular, but also patients. And so we've put a lot of time and effort into creating um, uh, instruction books that we can give to people. We have to do training programs, and even then, very, very hard job implementing this because P it, is, it is a disruptive technology. People really don't get it and you have to engineer it into a system that's providing care in a completely new way. That is one of the really important things uh, we've learned over time. This is the sort of interface it gives you. So it gives you the picture of overall symptoms. This is blue is the increase in uh, elevated depression, red is the elevated in mania. As well as that, the size of the blob gives you the severity of the specific symptoms. So you get both the overall score, but also the severity of symptom score. This is really useful clinically, because it means that I can see how a patient is even before they turn up. And of course, um, sometimes I might not need to see them. So I can begin targeting my clinical resource more at the individual patients. Because what we're really interested in is putting in smart algorithms that pick up variations so that we can intervene before serious uh, uh, d relapses, or for example. That's really tricky to do. Uh, and the sort of data analytics you need to do that are really unclear at this point. I'll come on to some of our ways of, of dealing with that challenge uh, in, in a bit. I'm not going to go through the technical back end um, because we've had to, we're very fortunate in having a really good software engineer team. Um, who are based in my department now, uh, led by Chris Hines. And they use a whole range of uh, technologies and they update the system all the time to make sure that it remains cutting edge. Um, and the other thing, of course, we're trying to augment it with, but you don't do this without knowing exactly how this is going to impact and whether it is going to be beneficial. So it remains very much a research area is we're augmenting this now in the same way that Matthew was talking about with these pervasive wearable devices that we're all getting. Uh, I think I'm wearing at least four or five at the moment. Um, I, you know, I've got my iPhone in my pocket, I've got my Pebble watch. 
which has a True Colors app on it, um, although that's just a, a research tool at the moment. We've got an instance for an Apple uh, Watch, but I don't have one of those because they're too expensive <laughs> and they're not waterproof and I tend to lose that kind of stuff. These are really important issues to take into, whereas this thing is waterproof and it's pretty cheap and, and it does the job. Now, we, we started dividing between active and passive data streams. So active data streams are those that the patient needs to do something with to put the data in. They can be annoying. Um, passive is where we just capture data from the use, the use of uh, a device, like the use of the phone, how quick the keystrokes <coughs> are, that sort of thing. So all, this, all the standard approaches to capture of data from these streaming devices. And of course, there's no shortage of these, and we use all these things, uh, Proteus patches, Shimmer, ECGs. We've got a better ECG than that. Different ways of rating mood. Um, we've got high-intensity studies like AMOS. You've got to play around, and you've got to play around with real patients, with real users, and with us. I wear all this stuff most of the time and see which ones I can put up with. And then we start thinking about whether we can make sense of the data. Because I think the point is that this, even though I'm quite enthusiastic about this approach, I'm incredibly skeptical, too, about whether it really is going to drive improvements in clinical outcomes. So this is where we are with it. With the standard uh, true colors, we've got about 2,000 uh, people doing it regularly. And some of those people have been doing this weekly-based rating for longer than 10 years. It gives a fantastic longitudinal picture of how people were going on. And of course, complete engagement, if it really is going to be helpful clinically, is absolutely critical. There is no point in having something that people will do for a day or two and then get fed up with. For me, that's the Proteus patch or the shimmer. I can only stand it for about 48 hours. Then I, 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 the true colors, the standard true colors, people will do for years. And that's what you need. If you're trying to do like we are, develop an app that will be used with people who have illnesses where you're trying to treat them alongside uh, clinical practice. Uh, we are now, and I'll come on to this, we're doing a trial, and I think later on we're going to have a presentation about Sleepio, and we've got a randomized study uh, which is using the True Colors platform to do an online rapid evaluation using randomization and web-based data entry. So that's one of those technical innovations that Andre was talking about earlier on, the sorts of things we need to be able to do. Online randomization, very straightforward, we can do it, we can randomize thousands of patients, but, it, but again, you need the engagement. It's very easy to do one of those trials very badly and get massive dropout, and that really doesn't tell you anything. Um, from a research point of view, we're, we're, we're interested in asking people who do have bipolar disorder and well-characterized uh, genetically uh, to, to collaborate, and so we've recently I uh, brought the Bipolar Disorder Research Network, which is a, a big cohort that was assembled for looking at the genes of bipolar disorder. About 6,000 patients, we've recently implemented that, and we've, I think we're now up to about 600 people who in, in that uh, study are doing that regularly. And there's a, a very nice high-risk cohort in, in Canada, and, and we're now about 75 to 100 of those are doing. And within our child and mental health services, one and a half thousand. So we're rapidly developing data, which, which of course is terrific from the point of view of looking at how people are going on. Uh, but it's at the moment that's data, and trying to convert data into something that actually delivers knowledge is a big challenge. And this, of course, is the big <coughs> data challenge that we're all in. It's very easy to generate data from these things now. It's much harder to convert that into knowledge and then benefit for patients. And I've therefore put a question mark at the end of this slide because we think that we think, and we have some evidence, that patients find this useful from the point of view of self-management, self-knowledge about their symptoms, understanding relapse signatures and signals, and uh, allowing other people to see the picture of their illness without having to endlessly repeat themselves. We think that clinicians like it because it means that symptoms are reported accurately. It helps draw up relapse prevention plans and it helps guide self-management. What have we done for evaluation? Well, we've, yes, we've looked at routine data. So we've looked at before and after comparisons. What are the standard outcomes before and after implementing this sort of uh, uh, device or, or this kind of technology? And there is some signal that it improves. I won't go through all the evidence. 
we did a randomized trial where we tried to randomly allocate this using a step wedge uh, design. Um, coming back to, again, it's a design that Andre was talking about earlier. Um, I think that was a complete failure, actually, because even though we put a lot of effort into trying to help implement it by training of clinicians, there was a massive difference between clinical teams that really got it and wanted to use it and those that didn't. And therefore, all we really ended up finding out was that some people quite liked this and some people really just saw it as a bit of a threat, um, replacement of the clinician, uh, which after all, coming back to more for less that the NHS wants, is not necessarily uh, an unreasonable fear. And obviously, we, we actively collaborate with health economists uh, really critically though and particularly in the development stages is these kind of engineering approaches of qualitative talking to patients really finding out what is going to be acceptable you can you can just cut out loads of uh, spuriously quantitative research if you just spend a bit of time working with people who are going to have to use the system and finding out what is likely to work and what isn't and making sure the solution you're coming up with really meets a clinical need rather than just being a cool deployment of technology. We were very fortunate in getting other people to be excited by the potential upstream uh, science that we could do with these sorts of data collection procedures. Um, and the Wellcome Trust gave us a strategic ward to see if we can find out more about the neurobiology underlying mood instability because we've got far more accurate measurement of the phenotyping of what people actually suffer from when we call them bipolar disorder. And it doesn't actually look like conventional pictures of bipolar disorder at all. Um, and that's a really promising approach, I think. What do patients think? Well, they think it's, you know, th these, these are some comments, obviously, they think it's pretty good. It doesn't apply to everyone. Promising technology, but I, even after 10 years, do not know that this is widely implementable and is cost effective. We're getting there. We're at a very early stage of this revolution. <coughs> I think it's worth investing time and effort in, but I don't think there are any quick or easy answers. Thank you. Thank you very much. We've probably got time for one question, if we're really quick. Yes, please. Front row. I saw you first. <laughs> Just shout okay. by the time the mic. I'm Fiona Mason from St Andrews. Um, you skip lightly over the matter of the record, so I'm just interested because is the data that's generated relating to in individual patients part of their medical record, or is it not? Well. It's not because it's, it's outside, um, it, so it's outside the clinical record because we want to use it for research. It's owned by the patient essentially, but of course you can get it into the patient record. That requires an interoperability job and you can get it in there. So um, I think our trust recently moved from a system called RIO to case notes. In RIO and the one before that we'd integrate it in the case records. We are at the point of engineering its integration with the current one. But of course the systems are different, so you have to create that link. I'll take one more, James. Um, <coughs> James Warren, senior fellow of NHS England. Um, you sort of touched on the on staff attitudes, and I wonder if you've drilled uh, you touched you touched on staff attitudes. I'm wondering if you drilled down in, into that a bit more in terms of are there particular personas of staff who engage with this a bit better than others? Or I mean, is that you know, I wonder if you could say a bit more about that. I can't really say much more about that. We know that it is an issue. Okay. Uh, I'd love to do more of that. And yes, the, 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 I think it's, it's a, big, um, a big issue when you're thinking about re-engineering the way you provide care. Mm. And at the moment, it's probably under-researched. Yeah, because it seems like we spend a lot of time profiling, phenotyping the people who use services, but not the people who deliver them. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> no, I think that's a very good point. Yeah. Yeah. I like that one. On, on, the, on that I wonder, note, I wonder, I wonder thank you very much, John. <laughs>